from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Someone in the Lift by L.P. Hartley There's someone coming down the lift, Mummy. No, my darling, you're wrong. There isn't. But I can see him through the bars. A tall gentleman. You think you can, but it's only a shadow. Now you'll see. The lift's empty. And it always was. This piece of dialogue, or variations of it, have been repeated at intervals ever since Mr. and Mrs. Meldon and their son Peter had arrived at the Brompton Court Hotel, where, owing to a domestic crisis, they were going to spend Christmas. New to hotel life, the little boy had never seen a lift before, and he was fascinated by it. When either of his parents pressed the button to summon it, he would take up his stand some distance away to watch it coming down. The ground floor had a high ceiling, so the lift was visible for some seconds before it touched floor level. And it was then, at its first appearance, that Peter saw the figure. It was always in the same place, facing him in the left-hand corner. He couldn't see it plainly, of course, because of the double grille, the gate of the lift and the gate of the lift shaft, both of which had to be firmly closed before the lift would work. He had been told not to use the lift by himself, an unnecessary warning, because he connected the lift with the things that grown-up people did. And unlike most small boys, he wasn't over-anxious to share the privileges of his elders. He was content to wonder and admire. The lift appealed to him more as magic than as mechanism. Acceptance of magic made it possible for him to believe that the lift had an occupant when he first saw it, in spite of the demonstrable fact that when it came to rest, giving its fascinating click of finality, the occupant had disappeared. If you don't believe me, ask Daddy, his mother said. Peter didn't want to do this, and for two reasons, one of which was easier to explain than the other. Daddy would say I was being silly, he said. Oh, no, he wouldn't. He never says you're silly. This was not quite true. Like all well-regulated modern fathers, Mr. Malden was aware of the danger of offending a son of tender years. The psychological results might be regrettable. But Freud or no Freud, fathers are still fathers. And sometimes when Peter irritated him, Mr. Malden would let fly. Although he was fond of him, Peter's private vision of his father was of someone more authoritative and awe-inspiring than a stranger. Seeing them together would have guessed. The other reason which Peter didn't divulge was more fantastic. He hadn't asked his father because, when his father was with him, he couldn't see the figure in the lift. Mrs. Malden remembered the conversation and told her husband of it. The lift's in a dark place, she said, and I dare say he does see something. He's so much nearer to the ground than we are. The bars may cast a shadow and make a sort of pattern that we can't see. I don't know if it's frightening him, but you might have a word with him about it. At first Peter was more interested than frightened. Then he began to evolve a theory. If the figure only appeared in his father's absence, didn't it follow that the figure might be, could be, must be, his own father? In what region of his consciousness Peter believed that it would be hard to say, but for imaginative purposes he did believe it, and the figure became for him Daddy in the lift. The thought of Daddy in the lift did frighten him, and the neighborhood of the lift shaft in which he felt compelled to hang about became a place of dread. Christmas Day was drawing near, and the hotel began to deck itself with evergreens. Suspended at the foot of the staircase in front of the lift, was a bunch of mistletoe, and it was this that gave Mr. Malton his idea. As they were standing under it, waiting for the lift, he said to Peter, Your mother tells me 
You've seen someone in the lift who isn't there. His voice sounded more accusing than he meant it to, and Peter shrank. Oh, not now, he said truthfully enough, only sometimes. Your mother told me that you always saw it, his father said again more sternly than he meant to. And do you know who I think it may be? Caught by a gust of terror, Peter cried. Oh, please, don't tell me. Why, you silly boy, said his father reasonably. Don't you want to know? Ashamed of his cowardice, Peter said he did. Why? It's Father Christmas, of course. Relief surged through Peter. But doesn't Father Christmas come down the chimney, he asked. That was in the old days. He does it now. Now he takes the lift. Peter thought for a moment. Will you dress up as Father Christmas this year, he asked, even though it's a hotel? I might. And come down in the lift? Why, yes, that's what it's for. After this, Peter felt happier about the shadowy passenger behind the bars. Father Christmas couldn't hurt anyone, even if he was, as Peter now believed him to be, his own father. Peter was only six, but he could remember two Christmas Eves when his father had dressed up as Santa Claus and given him a delicious thrill. He could hardly wait for this one, when the apparition in the corner would at last become a reality. Alas, two days before Christmas Day, the lift broke down. On every floor it served, and there were five, six counting the basement. The forbidding notice out of order dangled from the door handle. Peter complained as loudly as anyone, though secretly, he couldn't have told why. He was glad that the lift no longer functioned, and he didn't mind climbing the four flights to his room, which opened out of his parents' room, but had its own door too. By using the stairs, he met the workmen. He never knew on which floor they would be, and from them gleaned the latest news about the lift crisis. They were working overtime, they told him, and they were just as anxious as he to see the last of the job. Sometimes they even told each other to put a jerk into it. Always Peter asked them when they would be finished, and they always answered, Christmas Eve at latest. Peter didn't doubt this. To him the workmen were infallible, possessed of magic powers capable of suspending the ordinary laws that govern lifts. Look how they left the gates open and shouted to each other up and down the awesome lift shaft, paying as little attention to the other hotel visitors as if they didn't exist. Only to Peter did they vouchsafe a word. But Christmas Eve came, the morning passed, the afternoon passed, and still the lift didn't go. The men were working with set faces and a controlled hurry in their movements. They didn't even return Peter's good night when he passed them on his way to bed. Bed. He had begged to be allowed to stay up this once for dinner. He knew he wouldn't go to sleep, he said, till Father Christmas came. He lay awake, listening to the urgent voices of the men, wondering if each hammer stroke would be the last, and then, just as the clamor was subsiding, he dropped off. Dreaming, he felt adrift in time. Could it be midnight? No, because his parents had, after all, consented to his going down to dinner. Now was the time. Averting his eyes from the forbidden lift, he stole downstairs. There was a clock in the hall, but it had stopped. In the dining room, there was another clock. But dared he go into the dining room alone, with no one to guide him and everybody looking at him? He ventured in. And there at their table, which he couldn't always pick out, he saw his mother. She saw him too, and came towards him, threading her way between the tables as if they were just bits of furniture, not alien islands under hostile sway. Darling, she said, I couldn't find you. Nobody could. But here you are, she led him back, and they had sat down. Daddy will be with us in a minute. The minutes passed. Suddenly there was a crash. It seemed to come from within, from the kitchen perhaps. Smiles lit up the faces of the diners. A man at a nearby table laughed and said, Something's on the floor. Somebody will be for it. What is it? whispered Peter. Too excited to speak out loud. Is anyone hurt? Oh no, darling. Somebody's dropped a tray, that's all. To Peter, it seemed an anticlimax, this paltry accident that had stolen the thunder of his father's entry, for he didn't doubt that his father would come in as Father Christmas. The suspense was unbearable.
Can I go into the hall and wait for him? His mother hesitated and then said yes. The hall was deserted. Even the porter was off duty. Would it be fair, Peter wondered, or would it be cheating and doing himself out of a surprise if he waited for Father Christmas by the lift? Magic has its rules which mustn't be disobeyed. But he was there now, at his old place in front of the lift, and the lift would come down if he pressed the button. He knew he mustn't, that it was forbidden, that his father would be angry if he did, yet he reached up and pressed it. But nothing happened. The lift didn't come. And why? Because some careless person had forgotten to shut the gates. Monkeying with the lift, the father called it. Perhaps the workmen had forgotten in their hurry to get home. There was only one thing to do. Find out on which floor the gates had been left open, and then shut them. On their own floor it was, and in his dream it didn't seem strange to Peter that the lift wasn't there, blocking the black hole of the lift shaft, though he daren't look down it. The gates clicked too. Triumph possessed him. Triumph lent him wings. He was back on the ground floor with his finger on the button. A thrill of power, such as he had never known, ran through him when the machinery answered to his touch. But what was this? The lift was coming up from below, not down from above, and there was something wrong with its roof. A jagged hole that let the light through, but the figure was there in its accustomed corner, and this time it hadn't disappeared. It was still there. He could see it through the mazy crisscross of the bars, a figure in a red robe with white edges and wearing a red cowl on its head. His father, Father Christmas, Daddy in the lift. But why did he look at Peter, and why was his white beard streaked with red? The two grills folded back when Peter pushed them. Toys were lying at his father's feet, but he couldn't touch them, for they were too red, red and wet as the floor of the lift, red as the jag of lightning that tore through his brain. Christmas Entertainment by Daphne Froome Professor Conway, the well-known scientist, opened the door of his study, which, with its leather armchairs, green velvet cushions, and its parchment-shaped lamp in one corner, was his favorite room in the house. There was almost half an hour to spare before the children were due to arrive for the Christmas party, just time to make a note of an idea which had been running through his mind all day. The professor hated writing, particularly when he was working under the influence of some sudden inspiration. He hated the expression of his thoughts to be delayed, even by the time it took to form the letters with a pen. So now, padding rather heavily across the shabbily carpeted floor, he bent and lifted the black plastic cover of his tape recorder, set the reel spinning, and dictated his idea at considerable length into the microphone. Having used the tape to the end, he removed it, numbered it, and filed it away in the appropriate cabinet with all the others. Then he stood gazing complacently round at the walls, crowded on every side with shelves and cupboards, each crammed with data concerning every conceivable kind of psychic phenomena from vampires via poltergeist down to the mere unresolved echo in an empty modern flatlet. For years he had spent his spare time happily ghost hunting. His hobby had given him an excellent excuse to travel to places all over the world and to meet all kinds of people, different from and far more interesting than the academics who were normally his associates. What was more, as not one of the apparently mysterious incidents reported to him had withstood a properly organized scientific scrutiny, he had convinced himself absolutely that ghosts did not exist. Now he was ready to begin writing the book that would dispel forever the mist of superstition and probably make him a substantial sum in royalties as well. Plugging in the electric typewriter, he sat down at his desk and tapped out the title page. The Final Disappearance by Harold E. Conway There was no time for any more now. What a nuisance this party was proving to be. Mrs. Barker, the wife of his closest colleague, had established some years ago the tradition of holding a Christmas party for the children of the college staff. This year, however, she had taken it into her head to go away and foist the whole thing onto him. He had not liked either the acid way she had remarked that for once he could give up his solitary, self-centered existence and put his large house to good use. 
He went thoughtfully over to the window and stood looking up at the darkening sky. It had been raining, and the recently lighted antique lamps, in keeping with the architecture of the small square in which the house was situated, shone peacefully as inverted mirror images in the limpid water of the puddles. Suddenly the reflections were disturbed by a crowd of small boys as they came splashing along. His guests were beginning to arrive. Mrs. Megan Dent, the professor's cleaner and cook, a tall, smart, energetic young woman, lifted a tray of hot mince pies from the oven and began to arrange them on a large dish, chattering all the while to her husband, Tim, who, blowing up the last of the balloons, was for once unable to stem her flow of words. There's the first child arriving now. Oh, I do hope the party will go all right. Everyone's bound to blame me if it doesn't. I must say it's not at all like it was last Christmas in Mrs. Barker's house when everywhere was bright and seasonal looking. The professor would only let me put up a few bits of holly. Not that any amount of decoration would make this place look cheerful. Then again, instead of you dressed up nicely as Father Christmas, doling out presents, and what generous presents they were, there's to be a demonstration of some queer optical illusion in its old lecture room that's full of cobwebs and cold as charity because it's been out of use for years. Mr. Dent, deciding the balloon had reached a satisfactory size, stopped blowing, tied it securely with string, and said, Actually, the professor's going to conjure up a ghost. It's an old trick, but I don't expect the kids will have seen it before. I reckon they'll love it. It's far more exciting than Father Christmas. You only say that because you've spent every evening this week helping him to get it ready. You'll see it later on. I bet it will give you the creeps. After tea, Mr. and Mrs. Dent escorted the children, still consuming the remains of the cakes and sweets, into the small lecture theater for the entertainment. Professor Conway, twitching slightly, was beckoning Mr. Dent. I think we ought to check everything's all right before we begin. Mr. Dent pursued him onto the stage and disappeared behind the curtain. His wife, after hesitating for a moment, followed curiously behind. How's it done? she asked. Quite simple, really, the professor answered in a patronizing tone. You just have this large sheet of plate glass, he gave the glass a loud resounding tap, and by setting it up at an angle of 45 degrees to your audience, the light rays are reflected in such a way that it looks as if the spectators are seeing a transparent ghost behind the glass instead of an illuminated dummy placed out of sight at the side of the stage. Mrs. Dent glanced at the dummy. It's very cleverly constructed. Who made it? The professor, Tim Dent, replied, then added more quietly, being a bachelor, he's a dab hand with a needle and thread. They mustn't realize the glass is there, of course, the professor continued. I hope you like the way your husband has camouflaged the edges with his paintings of witches and dragons. You get a better idea of them from a distance, of course, Mr. Dent put in rather diffidently. The professor coughed impatiently at the interruption. The illusion is very convincing. When it was first demonstrated by one Professor Pepper in the 19th century, people came flocking to see it. Plays with his ghosts in were all the rage. They were better staged, of course, than ours will be with real actors playing the ghosts, but the principle was the same. Glancing at the dummy once more, Meg noticed that the professor neglected to fasten one of the shoes. As she was a neat, tidy person, the sight of the trailing lace worried her. She walked across, bent down, and nodded in a secure double bow. Standing up, she clutched at one of the arms to steady herself. It felt soft, almost human to the touch. As she moved, the grotesquely featured head rolled forward towards her. Hey, be careful, shouted Tim. What are you trying to do, wreck the show? You'd better be getting back to your seat. The professor will be waiting to make his introductory speech. Before I came to live in this house, the professor began, it was occupied by a man named Sir Arthur Stanbrook. Now, there is no doubt that Sir Arthur was a very clever scientist. He was an expert in electronics, like me. You often helped each other with our work. In fact, we soon became friends. We shared the same hobby, too. We were both fascinated by anything supernatural. I've always found it an absorbing subject, investigating ghostly happenings and proving that they don't exist. 
but Sir Arthur spent his time going round saying they did. Can you imagine someone as intelligent as that, considering it possible that ghost exists? The professor paused for effect, then went on. I thought it was dreadful that so clever a man should believe in such superstitious nonsense, so I challenged him to produce for me one of his ghosts. Of course he was unable to do so, and I am afraid we quarreled violently. It is now over twenty years since Sir Arthur died, but when I decided to conjure up an apparition for your entertainment, today I couldn't resist the temptation to make it like Sir Arthur. Later on I will try to explain how the trick is done, and perhaps one or two of you might be prepared to come up on the stage and be turned into temporary specters yourselves. Now if someone will kindly put out the lights. During the rather apprehensive whispering and shuffling that followed, Tim Dent switched on the arc lamps and then, drawing back the curtains, revealed the ghostly image. After about a minute, he switched the lamps off, then on, so the apparition appeared and reappeared again. Then he walked round behind the sheet of glass and stood in the circle of chalk he had carefully positioned so that the body of the ghost seemed to be superimposed onto his own. A nice touch, this, Tim thought. The children had suddenly become very quiet, he noticed. Perhaps they were beginning to get bored. He sauntered over to the edge of the stage and stood there, rather self-consciously bowing. His wife sat watching him quite proudly. She had seated herself at the back of the room, as far away as possible from the illusion on the stage. She was glad to see the image flicker and become blurred. Perhaps the demonstration would go wrong, and they could all spend the rest of the time playing games and singing a few songs. But the specter gradually began to appear again, only now the general shape had taken on more realistic contours. The mitten-like hands possessed fingers, and the mask-like face was transformed into something distinctly human. She opened her mouth to shout a warning to Tim, but for once the power of speech utterly deserted her, and she could only gasp fish-like. Professor Conway had descended from the stage and was walking between the rows of children, studying their obviously delighted reaction with smug satisfaction. Then he turned to survey the shadowy reflection he had created. It was certainly very realistic, but there was something odd about it when seen from this angle, he thought, a distortion that gave the impression that the sagging limbs were straightened and the lolling head had reared upright above shoulders suddenly squared. Then, as Tim extinguished the arc lamps, the specter vanished, and there was a roar of appreciative applause from the audience. The professor turned to Meg, huddled, pale and mute, in her chair. What a success! Look at them now, all pestering. Tim, to let him take a turn at being a ghost, I say, are you all right? I feel rather faint, Meg whispered. I think I'll go outside for a bit. Professor Conway smiled condescendingly down at her. Good heavens, Meg, it was only a trick. He elbowed his way back up on the stage among the crowd of excited children and shifted the dummy in order that they could stand one by one in its place. Controlling so many energetic youngsters was certainly absorbing work, but he still found time to worry about the strangeness of that final image. He found it impossible to concentrate on the problem with all these children enjoying themselves so enthusiastically around him. It was extraordinary how long it took them to get tired. The party seemed to continue for an almost interminable time, but when it had eventually dragged to a close, he turned to Tim and said, Really, the ghost looked most peculiar the last time you showed it. Could we see it again, do you think? Your wife seemed quite upset by it, too. You don't mean you were scared, Meg, Tim laughed. You just sit here with me, Mrs. Dent. And we'll soon solve all this with a simple scientific explanation, the professor added. I'd rather not. There's all the clearing up to be done. Oh, do stop fussing. We can clear up tomorrow. It's Saturday. Tim sounded impatient as he rather wearily began to demonstrate the spectral effect yet again. I can't see anything wrong, he called. Everything seems to be working perfectly f to me. I agree. Your wife and I were mistaken, of course. Professor Conway beamed at Meg. Let me give you a drink before you go. You've certainly earned it. He rose, and ushering them into his study, he happily dispensed generous quantities of whiskey to them both. The house seemed very silent after Megan and Tim's departure. It was just a contrast, the professor decided, after the pandemonium of the afternoon. Thank goodness it was over. The cost of the food had been quite excessive, not to mention all the extra electricity they had used.
Megan was certainly not the most economical of housekeepers. There were electric fires and lights still burning in all the downstairs rooms. Wandering around, switching them off, he came to the lecture room, where the image was still distinctly visible on the screen. He stood just inside the door, surveying it gloatingly. It really had amused the children. They could not think very highly of Mrs. Barker's parties after this. The effect really was extraordinarily good. The arc lamp seemed to be giving a far more powerful image than he had anticipated, too, and from here they almost produced the odd impression that the specter was lit by some inward source of its own. It also looked disconcertingly like Sir Arthur. He thought he saw the momentary gleam of white teeth as the mouth opened and closed again. The professor blinked, then fixed the apparition with a coldly questioning scientific stare. He wished he hadn't given the thing eyes. Even from this distance they seemed to be glowering back at him. And now the tall figure, swaying slightly, appearing to become more solid every moment, moved with slow deliberation out of the circle of chalk, straight through the glass, down from the stage, and along the aisle between the rows of chairs. Professor Conway suddenly realized that he could even hear the man's heavy gold watch chain clinking with a small rhythmic jingle. Still illuminated in the darkness by an eerie glow, its bald head gleaming, its loosely knotted tie flapping, the ghost turned and inclined its head towards him before disappearing into the corridor. Professor Conway hesitated only momentarily before giving chase. He caught a vague glimpse of it making its way across the darkened hall before it disappeared from sight. Glancing into each of the rooms as he passed, he reached and flung open the front door and stood surveying the scene outside. The rain clouds had given way to a clear sky and the moon irradiated the area with almost daylight brightness. The cutting wind had cleared the square of people. It was quite deserted. Very thoughtfully, he went back into the house. The whole thing must be a hoax perpetrated by Tim, he decided. This was the only possible explanation, and Meg, of course, had pretended to feel faint at the appearance of the ghost during the party just to add to the effect. Tim had probably by now crept into the house by the back door, and they were no doubt waiting together in the lecture room to plague him with further stupid infantile pranks. Well, they would not be given the opportunity to fool him a second time. He went into his study, and filling a large glass with the remainder of the whiskey from the decanter, he stamped upstairs with it into his bedroom. Stumbling into the kitchen the following morning, Professor Conway set the leftover coffee from the day before reheating on the stove and turned to address Tim. I did not think much of your idea of a walking ghost, he stated acidly. Tim looked confused. Walking ghost? What walking ghost? The professor breathed wearily over the pungent liquid full of grounds in the saucepan. You didn't return then after the party? Meg looked at the professor sharply. Hardly. We'd had quite a long enough day of it as it was. Well, someone played a ridiculous prank on me. The professor's red-rimmed brown eyes glared blearily into Meg's wide gray ones. Those loose slates rattling on the roof disturbed me, too. It was a very stormy night. I hope you haven't forgotten that I've asked you once or twice to climb up and deal with them, Mr. Dent. Tim, with the air of a man, fighting to retain the final vestiges of his patience, washed the last of the mugs, handed it to his wife to dry, squeezed the suds from the dish mop, pulled the plug out of the sink, and waited while the water bubbled slowly down the drain before replying. You sometimes seem to forget, Professor, that I do have my own work to do, and if there's anything to be dealt with today, it had better be the vacuum cleaner. It blew up when my wife plugged it in this morning. Why? She might very easily have been killed, the professor, haughtily ignoring Tim completely, turned out the gas beneath the saucepan and stepped across to the refrigerator for milk. As he opened the door, a small stream of water dribbled out and spread into a pool on the floor. Why, look at this. The thing's defrosted. Everything's swimming in water, he looked up. The blasted plugs in pieces. Those children, Tim laughed weakly, little demons. They must have done it. Last year at Mrs. Barker's, we had Hunt the Thimble, and it took us days to sweep up the horsehair stuffing they'd torn out of the chase lounge. Nonsense. It was perfectly all right when I went to bed. Then perhaps you and Tim really did conjure up a ghost. 
Meg cried. Perhaps it was that you saw walking. Perhaps it did for the vacuum cleaner, too. Who knows what it might not get up to next? The professor swore loudly. Of course there isn't a ghost. If that dummy's giving you hysterics, I'll go and burn the thing now, right away. Rushing from the kitchen, Professor Conway arrived breathless in the lecture room. The apparition that once more stared down from the sheet of plate glass seemed to be standing watching him. The face creased in the frown of malignant concentration, which the late Sir Arthur Stanbrook always wore when wrestling with some particularly taxing problem. The figure was already beginning to move. I'll soon put paid to you, the professor shouted. I'll turn the lamps off. Running forward, he mounted the steps onto the stage and hurled himself towards the switch. Tim and Meg reached the doorway just in time to see a brilliant flash reflected in the glass as the body of the professor slumped onto the stage. The ghost of Sir Arthur Stanbrook had disappeared, and perfectly distinct behind the glass that of Professor Conway had taken its place.